It's the end of the third quarter of 2024. Time to take another look at where NASA is preparing, building, and developing the three Artemis missions planned for the rest of this decade. In this video, I'll review what NASA and the Artemis contractors are telling us and not telling us about Artemis 2, 3, and 4, and right now there's plenty of both. I'll take a look at what the visible milestones or activity and updates say about progress and what the lack of updates says or doesn't say about schedules or the outlook for the future. Hey everyone, thanks for your time. As I record this on Saturday, September 28th, there's one workday left in the third quarter of 2024 on Monday. Fiscal year 2025 begins and October begins on Tuesday. Right now, we still don't have any update on the forward plan for Artemis II with respect to the Orion Heat Shield decision. It does look like Mobile Launcher 1 could be rolling back to the Vehicle Assembly Building at the Kennedy Space Center pretty soon. We saw Crawler Transporter 2 rolled out to the pad on Wednesday, September 25th as a part of those rollback preparations. While the wait continues, let's look back at the quarter, which included several milestones, but ends with that wait still in progress because the big questions remain unresolved. Leadership for NASA's Exploration Systems Development Mission Directorate made another public presentation to the Human Exploration and Operations Committee of the NASA Advisory Council in late August. They typically do this up to three times a year. One of the striking takeaways from this most recent meeting in the presentation was the almost complete absence of a future outlook. Looking through the presentation slides and listening to the presentation, almost all of the details are about completed milestones without much context about their timing. So we are seeing and hearing about progress, but it's hard to tell the pace of progress, which might suggest whether programs are staying on schedule, catching up, or falling farther behind, and how realistic the schedules are. If one sets aside Artemis II, where most of the pieces are complete and waiting in storage for executive decisions, the forward outlook for Artemis is basically unknown in public. These three missions, Artemis II, III, and IV, are scheduled between now and the end of the decade, but that relative lack of information and context about the situation for each mission means we continue to be left with a high level of uncertainty about the current schedule forecast. Unfortunately, that means rather than focusing on engineering or production or operations, we're focusing more on the lack of communication and the lack of information, which becomes more conspicuous over time. At the end of the last quarter, beginning of this quarter, the Artemis II Orion spacecraft was back in the altitude chamber for vacuum testing. SpaceX had completed Starship IFT-4 in early June, and SLS was getting ready to deliver a bunch of hardware for Artemis 2, II, 3, and 4 to the Kennedy Space Center. In July, SLS Core Stage 2 rolled out of the Michoud Assembly Facility in New Orleans and was delivered to KSC. On the day of the factory rollout, NASA and Boeing provided a tour of the factory floor, which helped to update the status of SLS stages production, in particular for Artemis 3 and 4. When the SLS core for Artemis II was offloaded at KSC on July 24th and moved into the vehicle assembly building there, officials were quoted at the event saying that the Orion heat shield investigation was wrapping up and that stacking of the Artemis II vehicle would begin in September. Near the end of the month, there was a hint of caution about long-term SLS plans from a Senate Appropriations Subcommittee chair, which was a noteworthy change. So far, there's been no change in appropriations, however. August was highlighted by government audit reports issued about Artemis IV elements, the initial gateway modules, the SLS Block 1B upgrade to the Exploration Upper Stage, and Mobile Launcher 2. I went over those reports in more detail at the time, but they all expressed concerns about technical issues and, as always, cost and schedule. We started to hear that there was still more work to do on the Orion Heat Shield investigation, which made it sound like a decision wasn't coming soon. After dropping off the Artemis II SLS core stage, NASA's Pegasus barge was next seen at Marshall Space Flight Center in mid-August, and NASA confirmed that the barge would pick up more Artemis II hardware in Huntsville, return to New Orleans, pick up Artemis III and four SLS hardware, and then return to KSC. The European Space Agency also shipped the Artemis III Orion European Service Module from Bremen, Germany at the end of the month. 
That hardware arrived at Port Canaveral in Florida within hours of each other in early September and was then offloaded and transported to different parts of KSC. The Artemis II SLS hardware is now waiting in storage. The Artemis III hardware went directly to their new production sites to get to their next milestones, and the Artemis IV SLS core stage engine section was temporarily parked in the VAB. September and the quarter is ending without another Starship flight test, somewhat surprisingly. SpaceX wanted to attempt to recover the Super Heavy booster on the next test flight, but their current launch license issued by the Federal Aviation Administration only covers the flight plan and trajectory flown by the early June IFT-4 test flight. In the middle of the month, a confrontation over the environmental impact of the rapidly expanding Boca Chica Starbase launch site went public, and the next flight test isn't expected until Thanksgiving now. Not quite as surprising, since it was hinted at in August, the quarter is also ending without a decision on Orion or Artemis II. The September 2025 target launch date is a year away, or 11 months away, depending on how you look at it, and now there's the question of whether there's enough schedule margin left or whether another delay is coming. Artemis II continues to get the most attention because it's the closest to launch, and I've covered those highly visible signs of progress all quarter, so awareness of the overall situation is relatively high. The September 2025 target is a year away, the SLS launch vehicle is ready to stack, and the mobile launcher might get to that milestone in the next month. Between the final assembly schedule and the heat shield situation, Orion is the wild card. All the Orion hardware for Artemis II remains in the Neil Armstrong Operations and Checkout building in the KSC Industrial Area. The mated Artemis II crew and service modules, also mated to the spacecraft adapter cone, are in the final assembly system test, or FAST cell, in the Industrial Operations Zone, or IOZ, where prime contractor Lockheed Martin is finishing assembly and test. We got a good overview of the final assembly status in the late August NASA Advisory Council meeting from Moon to Mars Deputy Associate Administrator Amit Chitria. The Artemis II target date was delayed right after New Year's in January due to issues with Orion Digital Motor Controller circuitry and the spacecraft batteries. He provided an update on those two issues as of August. So uh, I, when, I, when we spoke to the, the public uh, several, this is the beginning of the year, we discussed some liens against the spacecraft that were pacing our readiness. One of them was the, was the resolution of a, of a motor control issue on the life support system. Uh, these valves um, w basically allow the cabin to have access to CO2 sorbent beds that then takes that scrub CO2 out of the atmosphere and then swing and put that bed in, in communication with vacuum so that the desorption can occur in that environment. The, the valve controllers uh, we found an anomaly actually via the acceptance of the Artemis III instance of those controllers. And so as a result of that analysis and, and assessment, we, we have de determined a fix for that hardware. That fix was completed at, at Windsor Locks and the, those, the replacement boards have been installed into the, into the spacecraft and we now are back into a, a nominal configuration. We did not sync the, the, sync the controllers in exactly the same place uh, in the flight article. We, we found a different location for them in the crew cabin so as not to uh, you know, could kind of do some destructive teardown of some of the aqueous bays. Uh, so we're able to figure out a good, a good thermal and um, uh, spatial mounting location for those controls, control boxes, and they've been installed in the vehicle. Uh, we also discussed that uh, previously uh, uh, an observed uh, issue with the crew module batteries. Um, this is a new design that we have we have used. Uh, we've incorporated lessons learned from for many many decades of space flight to provide uh, protection for thermal runaway conditions in, uh, in batteries of this particular type. So that, that design uh, works perfectly from a functional standpoint. However, the way the batteries were actually stacked uh, in terms of the kind of the stack up, the mechanical stack up of the battery, uh, as we were going through the, the final abort sweeps uh, for acceptance, we discovered there, there was a mode, a mechanical mode that exists at very high acceleration regimes that could cause the batteries to, um, the, 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 the connectors that are holding the uh, the capacitance of the batteries to, to delaminate from the structure. And of course, these batteries are a must work function in the event of an abort. And so we were able to redesign the mechanical attack, attach fixtures. And that redesign has been, has been requalified. That work was done in Joplin, Missouri uh, by a wonderful company out there that supports us. And then we have, we have requalified that battery. Now we have to finish uh, the flight articles and they'll be ready and shipped to the Cape here in a couple of months to, for installation. Mr. Shatria also provided an important note about Orion final assembly. 
vacuum testing is also on. We, we finished a fir the first series of vacuum tests and functionals. We're going to have to go back into the chamber uh, here in a few months to, to finish that out. But right now, uh, we're focusing on testing the propulsion system. So that helps clarify the near-term outlook with the spacecraft going back into the altitude chamber in what sounds like October and new modified batteries possibly showing up somewhere around that. With that not expected until October, it also sounds like finishing up final installations and final tests wouldn't start until the middle of the fall at the earliest, which suggests that Orion wouldn't be handed over to Exploration Ground Systems for launch processing until somewhere around the end of the fall, which is basically end of the quarter, end of the year. That doesn't provide much margin for next September if the rough estimate was that the EGS launch processing timeline was around eight months. The delay back in January also provided more time to complete the heat shield investigation, though there was no outlook provided for when a decision or an announcement might happen. There was a lot of news and coverage of the Artemis II SLS during this last quarter, since half the pieces were moved from off-site storage to on-site storage at KSC in the Vehicle Assembly Building. The solid rocket booster segments and aft assemblies are in the RPSF, the Rotation, Processing, and Surge Facility. The aft assemblies are in the rotation building, and the rest of the loaded segments are in the Surge 2 building. The forward assemblies are being kept at the booster fabrication facility south of the VAB until stacking begins. The core stage and the launch vehicle stage adapter, or LVSA, are in the VAB. The core stage is parked in the transfer aisle, and the LVSA is sitting in high bay 4. The other pieces are still outside KSC, but the Interim Cryogenic Propulsion Stage, or ICPS, is a relatively short drive away in a Cape Canaveral facility. The Orion Stage Adapter is still in Huntsville and was expected to be flown to KSC on NASA's Super Guppy in November, around the same time as the ICPS was officially handed over to EGS and moved to the Multipurpose Processing Facility at KSC for eventual hydrazine fueling. All of that hardware is waiting for stacking, either in the VAB or a short drive away. With the exception of the OSA, which wouldn't be needed for stacking until probably the middle of 2025 at the earliest. Mobile Launcher 1 is still at Launchpad 39B, finishing up Integrated Systems Verification and Validation. This slide from the NASA Advisory Council meeting shows some of the testing that has been completed. According to NASA KSC Public Affairs, final crew access arm testing is the last round of tests before the ML would roll back to the VAB in early October. So, big picture, the forward outlook for Artemis II is that the decision on the Orion heat shield is likely to affect the target launch date. SLS has handed over the boosters, core stage, and LVSA to Explosion Ground Systems, and everything is essentially in storage, including the ICPS over on the Cape Canaveral Space Force Station side of the Eastern Test Range. Mobile Launcher 1 testing could wrap up soon, and it should be ready for stacking a month after it returns to the VAB. But knowing that the ML and SLS are ready to proceed doesn't clear things up much. Looking at Orion, the spacecraft batteries probably are not returning to the IOZ until October, and final assembly might not be completed until the end of the fall now. That by itself could jeopardize the September 2025 target date, but the heat shield decision still seems like the biggest factor. It doesn't necessarily make sense to proceed if the decision would be to replace the heat shield. The difference in heat shield options is a shorter delay versus a long delay, but Artemis II may be sliding towards 2026 either way. Just looking at the last quarter of the year, if there's no decision on the heat shield, things would get very quiet on the Artemis II front after the ML returns to the VAB, with maybe one exception that I'll point out coming up. As noted earlier, a missing or stale forward outlook has become a primary theme for Artemis III in particular, and Artemis in general. It's true of SLS, Orion, Starship, and so on. Starship IFT-4 was conducted almost four months ago at the end of the spring. Even back at that time, there was little schedule outlook for Starship between quote-unquote now and the Artemis 3 target date, which is September of 2026. Despite little schedule information to go on, the schedule ambitions for Starship remain high, with increasing talk about uncrewed missions to Mars in the next planetary window in about two years. 2026 is the same year that SpaceX has said they will have the Option A HLS spacecraft orbiting the moon for Artemis III. 
but none of the crucial HLS flight test demonstrations have been performed yet. We still don't know how many flight tests are needed until the ship-to-ship -ship propellant transfer demonstration or how many subsequent flight tests are planned in between that and the uncrewed lunar landing demonstration. Earlier in the year, it was mentioned that some lunar ascent objectives or requirements were added to the uncrewed lunar landing demonstration, and I asked the NASA Exploration Directorate about some of these. As has been the case for most of the last two years, I cannot get an interview to ask these questions about Artemis III planning. NASA considers this pre-decisional, but the level of uncertainty and doubt about the planning date and the amount of unfinished milestones only increases interest in these questions. Specific to the uncrewed lunar landing demonstration and the possibility of ascent demonstration or ascent objectives, on all the crewed HLS lunar landing missions, the spacecraft has to return the crew back to the gateway orbit, either to dock to Orion directly or to dock to the gateway. A typical lunar ascent starts with a launch from the lunar surface. After ignition and liftoff, Starship, in this case, inserts into a low lunar orbit, circularizes at apoapsis, and then makes a departure burn from the low lunar orbit to transfer from there to the near rectilinear halo orbit that Orion and or Gateway is in. Then the spacecraft will later make an NRHO insertion or NRI burn to begin the rendezvous and docking with either Orion or Gateway. So the general question is how much of this ascent from the moon back to the gateway orbit is desired or required to buy down risk from Artemis 3 when the two surface astronauts will be relying on Starship to get them back to Orion? These are the questions that I submitted. The response was to restate the high-level requirements for HLS Option A and refer me to SpaceX, which doesn't respond to media inquiries. Unfortunately, this has become a typical response from NASA about the future outlook for Artemis. The near-term outlook for Starship is also cloudy now, with IFT-5 no earlier than Thanksgiving, assuming that the estimated completion of launch license work is November 26th. Thanksgiving is the 28th of November. There was no update on progress with the Axiom lunar surface spacesuits in the last quarter. The most recent milestones reported were back in the spring. The next milestone would be the human in the loop vacuum test and then the critical design review after that, but it's unclear when those are scheduled and it's also unclear when completion of those milestones might be reported. For the Artemis 3 SLS, core stage production is the wild card. The rest of the launch vehicle is either in storage waiting for eventual stacking or completion is not considered critical to the schedule. The solid rocket booster motor segments were completed over two and a half years ago and have been in storage in Utah at Northrop Grumman's Promontory Facility since then. The ICPS for Artemis 3 was delivered to Cape Canaveral over a year ago and is in storage there. There was a short update on the booster assemblies, just about the aft skirts, which are going through integration and checkout at the booster fabrication facility at KSC, and then they will go back into storage. The two connectors, the LVSA and the OSA, are relatively uncomplicated elements, and the late August presentation noted that LVSA-3 was in the final phase of integration. So that leaves the core stage, which is the most complicated piece of the launch vehicle, and also the newest. The RS-25 engines are shuttle-era elements and are a distinct project external to the stage. Those are ready for installation and in storage at Senna Space Center in Mississippi. Core Stage 3 has been in the news over the last couple of months, to some extent based on completion of the Artemis 2 Core Stage, Core Stage 2. Core Stage 3 is now the next unit to complete, and the two critical paths we've been watching are production of the liquid oxygen tank and the engine section. When Core Stage 2 was rolled out of the factory, NASA and Boeing gave dignitaries and media a tram tour of the main factory floor, which is primarily the expanse of Building 103 and the adjoining buildings on its west and east ends. The engine section was shipped from Michoud to Kennedy Space Center in December 2022 to inaugurate integration, otherwise known as outfitting, in the space systems processing facility there. So what we saw at MAF on July 16th, partially, was the rest of the stage. More recently, Boeing provided an update at the beginning of September. 
The forward skirt and inner tank are still in integration, waiting for the forward join with the LOX tank. We saw the exterior of those in the forward structures area of Building 103 in July, and we got a glimpse of the LOX tank through some curtains in Area 6. In July, it was going through post-proof test non-destructive evaluations, or NDE, but Boeing noted at the beginning of September that the balance of baffle installation was in work. So that needs to be completed before the tank heads to cell E for internal cleaning, and then would be prepared for primer and spray-on foam applications. The liquid hydrogen tank was said to still be in preparation for foam sprays in cell N, which was also the case back in mid-July. With delivery of the engine section boat tail to the SSPF in early September, we got a visual of both on September 10th, showing that bolting of the boat tail to the bottom of the engine section was one of the next steps. That's based on installation of the quad pods, which are necessary to continue work after boat tail mate. I'm asking about the status of the engine section integration and some of the integration milestones, but we'll have to wait until into the last quarter of the year for the next update. At the end of August, we got the first status on construction of the core stage final assembly facility in VAB High Bay 2. NASA and Boeing provided the first multi-sentence update since the announcement of the facility in December of 2022. The VAB allows final assembly of the stage in a vertical orientation, which Boeing says will expedite the process when compared to the first two units, which were completed in a horizontal orientation at Michoud. Futuramic is building the platforms for Boeing, and the time-lapse video released in late August starts in January, showing early construction of the vertical integration platforms. Boeing says that the vertical platforms will be ready and operational in the fall. I asked about the status of the 325-ton bridge crane, which is one of two in the VAB. Back in December 2022, there was some question about whether the crane that supports lifting operations for VAB high bays 1 and 2 needed refurbishment, but Boeing says the crane is operational and in service. And actually, watching the time lapse, we can see that the crane was used to lift the first of the integration platforms into place. I also asked about possible near-term and longer-term plans for VAB High Bay 2. First, there was also the suggestion back in late 2022 that the Artemis 2 core stage, core stage 2, which is lying in the transfer aisle waiting for stacking, could be used for fit checks of the vertical platforms. However, that was following a much different schedule in 2023. For a long time now, it was expected that the Artemis II SLS would be stacked before VAB High Bay 2 was operational. The subsequent delays of Artemis II and the possibility of another delay now increases the chances that the High Bay 2 vertical platforms could be operational first. In that case, Boeing said, quote, We continue to work with the customer on opportunities to utilize the new tooling for Core Stage 2, unquote. So that's a possibility, assuming it could be done on a non-interference basis with Artemis II plans. Longer term, Boeing had been thinking about higher core stage production rates a couple of years ago, but those and other plans seem to have changed. The production and contract situation for SLS stages remains uncertain, but I asked what the current status was, and Boeing's response was, quote, we are currently prioritizing meeting the current manifest schedule. The platforms being installed on both the south and north sides of High Bay 2 are essential for achieving a production rate of one per year, unquote. With respect to when a second set of platforms might be built, the response was, quote, we are still working that plan with NASA, unquote. So for now, we'll wait for completion of the platforms and see what happens to Core Stage 2's 2024 schedule for the rest of the year. Assuming that the platforms are operational in the fall, that would mean that those at least are ready to support Core Stage 3 final assembly in 2025. For the Artemis 3 Orion spacecraft overall, we saw delivery of the European Service Module by Airbus and the European Space Agency at the beginning of this month. Following arrival in the IOZ, it was prepared for mating with the Crew Module Adapter. We saw pictures of both elements taken on September 4th. On September 27th, pictures and a blog post were published of the CMA to ESM mating activities. 
A few pictures taken on September 17th show the CMA positioned in the lift station with its forward walls now installed, joining the aft walls. There's also a couple of images taken on the 17th of ESM-3 being moved over to the lift station. The rest of the images were taken on Monday, September 24th, showing the CMA and ESM positioned in the lift station for the bolts to be installed and torqued to hard mate them. After that, the now mated service module will move into the clean room for the fluid line welds to integrate those systems. And then following that, the service module would be prepared for its initial power on or IPO. The NASA Advisory Council presentation also notes that the NASA docking system hardware was delivered to KSC for integration. There aren't any pictures of that, but Mr. Shatria provided some useful context about this NDS implementation. The new, new configuration of the crew module for Artemis 3 will include, of course, a docking system. This is what we call the NASA docking system. Uh, this is the or actually the Block 2 instance of the NASA docking system, which was first flown on, uh, on the Boeing Starliner vehicle. It has that design heritage in terms of the mechanical systems. The major difference is, of course, is some of the deep space rating we've done on the components, as well as the ability to flow unique commodities through, the, through fluid couplers in the interface of that development was extremely challenging given the needs for gateway and some of the other uh, components that are going to require uh, that capability as they flow segment to segment across the spacecraft. They will have to flow xenon, it'll have to flow uh, bipropellants and a handful of other things. So developing that, that fluid coupler system has been a, has been a big challenge, but uh, we, we, we're, we're, we're doing a, we've got it there now. We've got the, via, the docking system ready to be integrated into the crew module and, and we're going to start uh, that work here. Uh, just in a few months. The Orion crew module is also in integration, but we haven't seen much of it this year. There was a shot of it during a tour of the IOZ by the Artemis II crew and their family back in the first quarter. Unlike the Artemis II build, this crew module build has its own set of avionics, but now there is the heat shield issue. The heat shield for Artemis III was already assembled with the Artemis I design and was in testing, so the Avco blocks were already fabricated and bonded to the carrier. It's less likely that NASA would choose to fly that as is on Artemis 3, but advancing a new heat shield build and replacing the current Artemis 3 unit would not be as disruptive to the overall build. It would still be an issue though. Following the news that the service module integration is underway, beginning with the physical bolting of the ESM and the CMA, the Orion program said via NASA KSC Public Affairs that the initial power on of both the crew module and the service module are now projected next spring in the spring of 2025. With respect to the launch abort system hardware for Artemis 3, still no status or updates on that. Also for Artemis 3, EGS is not planning development and or upgrades for Mobile Launcher 1 and Pad 39B systems between Artemis 2 and Artemis 3. Refurbishment of the ML and PAD systems will be required, and changes to hardware and software will be made to address any issues that come up during the Artemis 2 launch campaign and launch countdowns. Right now, the future outlook for Artemis 3 is mostly unknown. Besides a target launch date of September 2026, visibility into the milestones is hard to see beyond the near term. In the near term, we know the next step for a few things based on the recency of the last step. In the last quarter of 2024, integration of the Orion service module elements should be completed, VAB High Bay 2 should become operational, and Starship IFT should fly. And we got this most recent update from Orion assembly and test that the initial power on for both the crew module and service module is targeting next spring. That Orion IPO forecast is about a year later than the one from mid-2023 which forecast Orion handover to EGS a year after the IPO milestones. If we apply that speculatively to this update, that would project Orion handover to EGS towards the spring of 2026, which is likely too late to support the public September 2026 target date. But it's possible that the other Artemis 3 programs are running out of margin too. It's hard to tell because those other schedules have not been updated at all, and there isn't much else to go on. The overall schedule hasn't been updated since January when the most recent Artemis 3 delay was announced. Where we are right now with the big picture outlook for 2025 is that NASA says Artemis 2 should fly, the Artemis 3 SLS hardware should be finished and ready for launch processing, the Orion hardware should almost be there, 
and the Starship HLS should be through critical design review and headed towards its first flight test to the moon in 2026. With little evidence to support that though, in terms of schedules or intermediate milestones, it will be hard to tell how healthy or unhealthy the Artemis III schedule is unless we get one of the two opposite ends of the spectrum. Either all of the milestones are accomplished in 2025 or none of them. There is also the Orion heat shield decision, which is likely to affect the big picture schedule for Artemis III. However, a delay in the Artemis II launch date doesn't necessarily delay production of SLS hardware or Starship development progress or development of the Axiom lunar surface spacesuits. There was one response from the NASA Exploration Directorate to the list of questions that I submitted about Artemis III, which was about the timing of assigning a flight crew to the mission. The response was, quote, we have not yet identified a specific timeline for naming the Artemis III crew, but still plan to announce them approximately 18 months to two years ahead of the flight, unquote. Well, we've already reached the two-year warning, so to speak, for Artemis III in September 2026, and L-18 months would be next March. By that measure, a flight crew could be named any time in the next six months between now and then. However, given the situation with the Artemis missions right now, it's more likely that Artemis III will be delayed again in the next six months than that a flight crew is named. And if Artemis III is delayed, then an announcement about a flight crew assignment could also be delayed. Similarly, for Artemis IV, we have the status of a few elements or a recent milestone, but not much in the way of a forward outlook. For the initial gateway elements, the power and propulsion element, and the habitation and logistics outpost, we're seeing more pictures of the propellant tank installs into the PPE that occurred a few months ago. There was one picture of the halo module configured with test equipment for a static load test at Tala Selenia Space, Italy, but the NASA Advisory Council meeting slides say that test is complete. The halo module structure still needs to complete a proof pressure test before it can be shipped to a Northrop Grumman facility in the Phoenix area here in the U.S. That was supposed to happen by the end of this year, so we'll see. Otherwise, there hasn't been much news about assembly and test of PPE and HALO this quarter, and we still have not heard about a new target launch date for them. The agency baseline commitment is launch in December of 2027, which is three years away, with arrival in near rectilinear HALO orbit about a year or so later. Realistically, that projects to arrival in the Gateway orbit in 2029. It's been almost a year since the authority to proceed for the Dragon XL Gateway Logistics spacecraft, but not much information since then about progress or the next milestones. It's not clear where in the project life cycle that effort is. For the International Habitation Module, or IHAB, the only news from the quarter was in a footnote in the OIG report about SLS Block 1B, stating that IHAB completion is the secondary critical path for Artemis 4 behind Mobile Launcher 2 completion. The presentation to the NASA Advisory Council in late August also noted that the Option B Starship design was working towards preliminary design review, but one of the questions there is whether that's predicated on Option A milestones or not. For EGS, Mobile Launcher 2 construction is the biggest work project to complete for Artemis 4. The presentation slides noted the jack and set milestone that was completed in the last quarter in May, and also a rig and set milestone, but provided no time frame for that. Via NASA KSC Public Affairs, EGS provided this update. Quote, the chair structure, which is the first 80 feet of the tower, will be assembled on the base of the structure this fall. The rig and set module 4 operation will follow beginning with the installation of the first of seven tower modules in the winter time frame." Unquote. During the presentation last month, NASA leadership praised Bechtel and their progress, but simultaneously the OIG report released prior to that in August provided the first disclosure of the agency's baseline commitment which is a delivery from Bechtel to EGS in September 2027, which is also three years from now. NASA suggests that Bechtel has turned a corner in construction of the new ML for SLS Block 1B and Block 2, and the report notes areas where things are stabilizing. But OIG also suggests that it will be a challenge to stay on schedule. So we have at least a little visibility into the next maybe two quarters or six months. 
The ML base, the launch platform, is being built out after it was put on the permanent pedestals at the East Park site in May. We should see the base of the umbilical tower go up on the platform next, that's the chair structure, and then the rest of the tower should start to be stacked somewhere around the end of this year, beginning of next. Artemis 4 is the first flight of the SLS Block 1B upgrade, and completing development of those elements will drive space launch system readiness for that launch. I am working to get a more detailed update on EOS assembly and test status, but we have not seen much progress with the vertical assembly center confidence welds. We saw the LH2 dome for the weld confidence article loaded in the tool in July, but we haven't seen an update on completion of the two confidence welds in that tool. The other two new pieces for Block 1B are the new connectors for EUS. An inner stage connects EUS to the core stage. It's basically two 8.4 meter diameter barrels and L-rings on either end. The universal stage adapter connects the 8.4 meter EUS to the Orion spacecraft adapter cone, which has the same 5.5 meter diameter at the bottom as the Orion crew module adapter. The USA provides a volume and launch fairing for a 10-ton class secondary payload to Orion. That secondary payload capability would increase by a few tons with the Block 2 upgrade of the SLS solid rocket boosters sometime in the next decade. We saw elements of an interstage structural test article at MAF in pictures and during the mid-July tour, but no status or schedule for that. It will need to go to the Vertical Assembly Center tool after the confidence welds on that test article are completed and validated. Assembly and test of USA test articles is continuing in Alabama. A development test article is already at Marshall Space Flight Center going through a first round of structural testing in Building 4619. And the presentation slides noted that the qualification article, the structural test article, is being assembled in Decatur by prime contractor Lidos. Looking at the base SLS elements that are common to the Block 1 and Block 1B configurations, solid rocket motor production is relatively mature, and Northrop Grumman has completed the five-segment boosters for NASA well ahead of schedule. Even though Artemis IV is likely to slide towards the end of the decade, the solid propellant for most of the motors have already been cast in the cases for Artemis IV. Those will likely be headed into storage soon, and the whole set will be stored at the Promontory Facility in Utah beginning probably next year. Artemis IV would use the last set of Space Shuttle main engines, which were adapted for SLS with an upgraded engine controller hardware and software, and are now called RS-25. Those engines have basically been ready to fly for years and are waiting in storage at Sena Space Center. A set or subset of backup engines would be needed to support Artemis IV and prime contractor Aerojet Rocketdyne, now with L3 Harris, has restarted the RS-25 production lines for all the line replaceable engine components. We should see new flight engines that are expected to fly on Artemis V start being acceptance tested at Stennis between now and Artemis IV. For Core Stage 4, the structural elements are ready to be assembled, but there's the question of priorities for Artemis 4 between the EUS and interstage structures and the Core Stage 1s. The engine section is the long lead for production, followed by the inner tank, and those two elements are the farthest along. The engine section was just transported to Kennedy Space Center at the beginning of this month and is temporarily parked in the VAB transfer aisle until Boeing finishes reconfiguring the Artemis III engine section and their workspace in the SSPF to support both elements. Some integration work like orbital tube welding of hydraulic and pneumatic lines was started while the engine section was still in New Orleans since transportation to KSC was delayed several months earlier in the year by the delay to Artemis 2 II and 3. Boeing will pick up with integration of the Core Stage 4 engine section once it is set up in the SSPF. The inner tank structure is more or less complete, but the delays with the Artemis 3 Core Stage liquid oxygen tank, mostly during 2023, have backed up that hardware. There's only one set of integration tooling for the inner tank, and that is still being used by the Core Stage 3 unit. Eventually, the Core Stage 4 inner tank will move to the Cell G TPS spray booth for its multi-layer foam sprays, and then it would move into integration. 
The rest of the structural elements are waiting for availability of the vertical assembly center. The two propellant tanks and the forward skirt need to go into the VAC for ring to barrel, dome to barrel, and barrel to barrel welds. Since course stage four is not a critical path element for Artemis IV, either overall or for SLS specifically, it remains to be seen how production of those elements will fit in the traffic pattern of flight hardware going into the weld tools at MAF. There was no public update to the status or outlook for production of the Artemis IV Orion spacecraft in the last quarter. Now that Airbus completed and shipped ESM-3 from Bremen, Germany to KSC, integration of ESM-4 is next there. Airbus and ESA are working towards a goal of delivering one ESM a year. We'll see where they are around this time in 2025 with ESM-4. There was no public update on assembly and test of the Artemis IV crew module and crew module adapter though. In terms of the outlook for Artemis IV, we're waiting to see the SLS Core Stage 4 engine section move into the SSPF, the Halo module complete proof pressure test and ship to Arizona, and the VAC confidence welds completed for exploration upper stage. Maybe we will see these in the last quarter of the year, and beyond that we could see the Mobile Launcher 2 umbilical tower stacked on the platform next year. But beyond that, it's very difficult to tell how healthy the Artemis IV schedule is overall, or for the individual programs, from Gateway to the Lunar Lander to the SLS upgrade and new Mobile Launcher. The lack of perspective just adds to the uncertainty and doubt in public about the September 2028 target date. One note about Artemis 5 and beyond, as the fiscal year ends and the new one begins, there's still no word on the status of the commercial or commercialized SLS contract or contract negotiations. The first contract was supposed to have been signed in the spring, and the silence here also adds to the uncertainty and doubt about long-term plans for SLS production. That increases the uncertainty and doubt about the chances that the hardware for one SLS vehicle can be delivered on an annual basis by the end of this decade. Realistically, with constrained budgets and a new era of austerity in Washington, D.C., the question is more when that production rate can be reached in the next decade. Thanks for watching. Click on the like button if you found this video informative.